But we pick it up here in, in uh, chapter 4 and verse 1. Therefore, my beloved and longed for brethren, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, beloved. And I implore, Eudia, and I implore. Now, the, you, you look at this name. This name is, it's, it's an impossible name to, uh, to say in the English translated from the Greek. But it's Sintuke. That's the, that's the true, that's a true translation of that name. Sintuke, but I'm going to call it Sintichi. So I'm just kidding. Sintuke, to be of the same mind in the Lord. The, the theme, and just to kind of give you guys a backdrop of the theme of Philippians. The theme of Philippians is about unity. Paul is writing to the church at Philippi, and he's warning them. He's imploring them to stay unified. There was a division in the church. There was a division in the church, and the division was caused by these two ladies who were really going at it, but they were servants of the Lord. These two particular women, they loved Jesus, they loved the Lord, they loved his work, they loved the church, but they had different conflicting opinions on how things should go. And so there was a division, there was a strife, there was some fighting. And listen, by the way, this happens in families. This happens in the body of Christ a lot. There are things that, you know, uh, that happen within the body of Christ that will cause people discomfort or cause people some irritability. And so after that, you know, what happens generally is that people now, especially in the church at large, people will just leave. People will just leave fellowships and leave churches because there's some, sort, there's some person that's at that church that's, that's irritating them. And so that's never the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ is o- always wants people to reconcile. The mind of Christ and the body of Christ always want, the mind of Christ is always wanting people to reconcile and come together and to reaffirm their relationship. And so that's what he's saying here. He's saying, listen, he's like, I want you two ladies to be of the same mind in the Lord. And then he says, I urge you also, speaking to, in verse 3, it's speaking to the church at large. I urge you also, true companion, help these women who labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Now listen, he mentions the book of life here, which, by the way, I think is a, is a great little parenthesis for our study. You have to really remember that no matter how difficult things get, and this is why you know, I entitled this message just Contentment Simple. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, what causes us to rejoice, because Paul is going to say that very thing. He's going to say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord. At the end of the day, the thing that should cause us to rejoice the most is that no matter how difficult things get in this life, that our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And there are people, listen, I'm just going to tell you, just give you a quick story. I, you know, just recently, as many of you know, I can't, I retired off the fire job down in Massachusetts, you know, a couple of years ago. And, um, you know, the fire department's a really close-knit group of guys and gals. Um, Recently, in Wells, the chief of the fire department just died suddenly. He, He just I mean, just died suddenly. He was battling cancer, I guess, for the past couple of months. He'd known about it, and he just died suddenly. And um, it was really tough. It was a tough thing for a lot of people who know him, myself included. I was just like, whoa, dude, I was just talking to this guy like a couple of months ago. And he was a really, really nice guy, really super dude. But you just never know what's going to happen. You never know when that time is going to come. And so the, what, what causes us to rejoice is that our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. We have no fear of death. Therefore, we have no fear in life. So this should be one of the contributing factors to contentment and stability in our own minds. He says, and I urge you also, in, in fact, no, rather in verse 4, he says, rejoice in the Lord always. And then he repeats it. And again, I will say, rejoice. There used to be a song that was written with these verses here. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say, rejoice. He says, let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Because what was going on within the body of Christ is there was fighting within the body. They were arguing with one another. And so Paul, he's just really encouraging them. He's saying, no, 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 listen. He goes, rejoice in the Lord. Don't come together and fight about stupid stuff. Don't come together and divide over issues that really don't matter. You're not gonna, you shouldn't be dividing the body of Christ because you have differences in certain opinions or you've got certain tactics or you've got certain ways of doing things or you live your life one way and some person lives their life another way. When it comes, as long as what they're doing isn't sinful or against the word of God, let them alone. Don't divide. You know, really, don't cause division within the body of Christ. So he says, he really just encourages them. He says, rejoice in the Lord. Lord, your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. That should be causing you to really sing your praises. And by the way, I get the same way. I get down. I get depressed. I came in tonight, man. I'm sick as a dog. <laughs> sick as a dog. But I came in tonight. And my, I'm sitting there going like, man, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm talking to the Lord earlier. I'm like, Lord, I cannot make it tonight. I just can't. I can't do it, Lord. I can't. 
The Lord says, no, you got to do it. This is your job. This is your calling. You need to get up and you get rolling, get going. That's how he talks to me. I don't know how he talks to you. But when I start getting, when I start getting, you know, crying for myself and feeling sorry for myself, that's how the Lord talks to me. But the truth of the matter is, is that this is a, the desire of my heart is to rejoice in the Lord. The desire of your heart should be to rejoice in the Lord, even if we are feeling down or even if we're going through it. And by the way, it's not to say that certain things that we're going through aren't real and difficult. They are. The trials and the tribulations of life are incredibly difficult, especially when it comes to financial problems, the loss of a loved one, health issues. These are real problems. And I don't demean those or diminish the, the importance of those in any way. Those are real issues, man. And it's hard. It really is. It's difficult to go through those things and go through those times and say, you know something, Lord, I'm going to rejoice anyway. It's really hard. But here's what I'm going to say to you. Take the Word of God and apply it. Trust what it says. He goes on. He says, Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. And I love seeing that verse there because the Lord is at hand. Now he says this. For those of us who have battled with anxiety and worry and fear, he says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything. Look at what he says. By prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. He says, don't worry. What are, we, what are you worried about? He says, let your requests be made known to God. He says, don't be anxious for anything, but by everything, look at this, in prayer, that's just common prayer to God, and then by supplication. A supplication very simple as this. It's a humble request to the Lord. Ask the Lord for what you want. There's nothing wrong with that at all. I go, I got a laundry, I don't know about you, but my list is a mile long. I got lots of stuff I'm praying for. I got lots of stuff I'm going to the Lord and asking Him for. Now listen, sometimes the answer is no. But I'm going to ask him anyway. I'm going to put it out there, man. I am. I'm, there's nothing, because nothing is impossible with Christ. Nothing. And so I'm going to ask him for the impossible. I'm going to ask him for those things that, are, that seem utterly impossible from my vantage point. I'm going to ask him for those things. But then he says this, with prayer, supplication, and there's a key, with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known to God. Yeah. When was the last time we really did thank the Lord, even for the difficulties that we're having to endure? And you start to really thank God. You start to really say, you know something, Lord, thank you so much for everything that you have done in my life, in and through my life up until this point. Thank you. Thank you for even the times where I've had to go through difficult things because you've chiseled out my character in those things. Thank you. And he goes on, he says, look at this, and the result... When we find ourselves consumed with worry, consumed with fear, consumed with doubt, consumed with anxiety. Listen, I just want to let you know, anxiety is a part of life for a lot of people. But the result of an increased prayer life is this, in verse 7. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Why? Because the heart will always make a convert of the mind. And prayer is the way that you guard your heart. The heart will always make a convert of the mind. And that's why he always deals with the heart. That's why he gives us a new heart. The result is peace. Not even peace with God. We already have peace with God as sons and daughters in Christ. Peace with God is already accomplished. It's a peace of God. It's a lack of worry. It's a lack of anxiety. It's a lack of fear. Because fear is debilitating. Fear is. I mean, think about it. Think about how many times you've been caught up in worry. Worry. I mean, just literally scared to death over things that haven't even really happened yet or things that are coming down the road. I mean, worry and fear and anxiety are things that people suffer from. And by the way, I don't know about anybody else in here, but I used to suffer from anxiety a lot. When in my younger days, man, anxiety was just a part of life. You couldn't get me into a crowded room. It wasn't happening. You couldn't get me in a, into a crowded room if I didn't have some sort of, I used to call it a greaser. You couldn't get me into a crowded room. It wouldn't happen. You couldn't get me doing anything that was going to go outside my comfort zone unless, it was, unless I was self-medicated. But he says, no, no, no. If you really want to overcome your fear and overcome your worry and overcome your anxiety, then you need to pray because that's the remedy. That's the remedy. I mean, think about the desperation 
of prayer sometimes. When was the last time we spent an hour or two on our knees really crying out and seeking to the Lord? Think about it. Listen, and this is, by the way, this is something that convicts me too. I'm not just preaching to you. I'm preaching to me. I have to think back in my heart and in my mind. I have to really think back. When was the last time that I was desperate, really desperate to see God move in such a way, in such a powerful, mighty way that it caused me to fall on my face? How desperate am I? How desperate, how, how really, I mean, just consumed with the will of God for my life and wanting to see the Lord move, how desperate am I? How much should I be praying or should you be praying? Marriages, relationships. How desperate are you to see marriages and relationships restored? How desperate? How desperate are we to really want to see the Lord work? But yet we try to figure things out. And some of us have really been given abilities. We've been given certain you know, skills and we've been given some wisdom. And sometimes we just rely too much on that. Sometimes we just rely too much on our own wisdom and on our own skill and on our own flesh. And things start to fall apart and we try to handle things in our own way according to our own strengths. And we never really talk to the Lord about any of that stuff. And then we wonder why things are in shambles. So, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will, look at this, it will guard your hearts and your minds. Why? Because the heart will make a convert in the mind and that's where the warfare starts. That's where anxiety begins. That's where worry really takes root is in our minds. That's what happens. That's where fear starts to over... Listen, I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm the only one in the room. I don't think so, but maybe. Have you ever worried about something or feared something in your mind so much to the point where it's got you to a... To, to a a staggering, an overwhelming feeling of just complete and total insanity where you're having conversations that have never happened. You're already thinking about five or four things about with one person or a conversation with people that have never happened. You're already arguing in your mind about things that have never happened at all. You're already, you, think about it, listen. You're having conversations and you're having concerns and you're worrying about situations that have never happened and all of it is in your mind it's in your mind listen you're already anticipating what somebody else thinks you're already anticipating what somebody else is saying you already anticipate what somebody else is going to do and that's all in your mind all of it the whole situation is all in your mind And that's what he says. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And then in verse 8 he says this. He says, finally, brethren, these are the things that you can think about. It's, I, this is the, the best re- replacement theology that you can come up with. It's not true rep- replacement theology, but this is, what, this is what we should be thinking on. Finally, my brethren, whatever things are true, Why? Because love rejoices in the truth. Whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, and whatever things are of a good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, he says, meditate, think on, keep your eyes on these things. That's what he says. Meditate on those things. Because how much time, now listen, I'm going to tell you, now look, from a practical standpoint, this is just something you can take and practice. You don't have to if you don't want to, but this is just something that helps me from a very practical standpoint. At the end of the day, I wonder why I can't sleep because I've been filling my brain with garbage all day. Look, I wonder why I can't sleep because listen, if you're, if you're like me, I love to watch the news and get irritated. It, you can pray for me, all right? You can, you can pray for me. But I like to watch the news. I like, the, I like to see. Now listen, there are things going on in the world. Sometimes there's things that I like to know what's happening in other parts of the world. I like to see the book of the Bible coming to fruition in life. Yeah. But then there are things happening in other parts of the world, in our own country, that make me insane. But I like being insane. <laughs> so I watch some things. I watch some things on the news. And I watch some things that really fuel my fire and get me going. And then I wonder why at the end of the night I'm awake at 11.30 at night just staring at the ceiling. Because I haven't been applying what I'm reading here. Whatever things are noble. Whatever things are good. Praiseworthy. Of a good report. What are these things? He says, meditate on these things. 
Look at these things. Then he goes on. Whatever things are lovely and whatever things are of a good report, if there's anything praiseworthy, he says, meditate on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw. In who? In me, he says. These do. And the God of peace will be with you. Listen, what separates a leader? I'm going to tell you right now. Because I know lots of people who think they're leaders and they ain't. But you can tell a leader by how his or her life is. You want to know who to follow? Follow somebody who's following Christ. And the only way you know that is not how well they know Scripture. It's how they live their life. How their life is. You ain't a leader if your life is in shambles. Period. And you need to, be, you need to know that. You need to know who to follow. And so what Paul says real quick is, everything that I did, you do. He would say, follow me as I follow Christ. He would say things like, you know something? I'm in, he would talk to his, his son Timothy, his true son in the faith. And he would encourage him to do exactly what he did. In fact, there was no one who was like-minded, as like-minded as Paul, than Timothy. And he knew that he could trust Timothy to take over a church. Because he had the same mind. You want to know who to follow? Take a look at their life. Listen, don't follow me because I know the Bible or I preach. If you want to follow me, you follow me as I follow Christ. But take a look at my life. My life is an open book. You can ask me anything about anything in my life at any point in time. But Paul also goes on. He says this. In verse 10, he says, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at last your care for me has flourished again, though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I've learned in whatever state I am to be content. You see that? Look at Turn with me to 1 Timothy 6. Turn to the right a couple of pages. 1 Timothy chapter 6. I'm going to read this real quick, and we'll start in verse 3. If anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to doctrine which accords with godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words from which come envy, strife, reviling, evil suspicions, useless wranglings of men, corrupt minds, and destitute truth, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. From such, withdraw yourself. Who's he talking about? He's talking about the name it, claim it psychos that are out in the church today, just so we're clear about that. He's talking about the people that look at the church as a means of gain. Okay? Do not believe in that doctrine or that theology. It is way off. You cannot speak it and then all of a sudden it happens. Way off. But here's what I'm going to tell you. What he says is this. Anybody who wants to get into any Bible disputes or useless wranglings over theology or doctrine that doesn't make any sense or doesn't really matter, he says, get yourself away from them people. Don't follow them. Don't even... I've been asked a lot, like, are you going to ever do a, like a Q&A here, a Bible Q&A here? I will probably do one at some point. But where it stops is when somebody wants to start getting into some sort of debate with me on stage. That's where, I, that's where it stops. He says, look, godliness in verse 6. Now godliness with contentment is great gain. You see that in verse 6? Godliness with contentment is great gain. For look, we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain that we can carry nothing out. Anybody who tells you that you're not godly if you're not rich doesn't know what they're talking about. They have no clue what they're talking about. Godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain that we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing... With these, we shall be content. Dude. Everybody you talk to in the name of claimant movement, you tell them this verse, all of a sudden they, their minds blow out of their head. They don't know what to do with this. Well, what are you telling me? Godliness with contentment is great gain. The Bible says that if I got food and clothing, I should be happy and content. If that's the case... I got food in my belly, clothes on my back, and all too often times this, is, this isn't the case. We lack contentment because we're really looking for the Lord to come through in different ways. And He's just not stepping to the beat of our own drum. And we lack contentment. Go back. <clears throat> Go back. 
We'll pick it up again in verse 11. He says, Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. But look at this in verse 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We know that verse. We love that verse. We claim it all the time. Everybody knows it. You probably got it written on a sticker in your house. Or you put it on a bumper sticker. Or you got it on a bookmark in your Bible. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But do you know what he's talking about? He's talking about being strengthened in need. He says, I know how to, I know how to be a base. I know how to bound. I know how to have nothing. And I've been, he's been rich and he's been poor. He was a Pharisee. You couldn't be a Pharisee if you weren't rich. Saul of Tarsus was a guy with money and with a guy with influence and, with a, guy, and a guy with means. Prior to his, his conversion, he was a man who was really somebody. In fact, he lays out for us a little bit earlier in Philippians chapter 3, kind of his, his quote-unquote re- religious credentials, so to speak. And he had some. But in all of those things, he counted all of those things as rubbish. So what he says, real simple, is I've learned how to be rich, I've learned how to be poor. I've learned how to be full. I've learned how to be hungry. And I've learned that in all things, Christ is moving in me and through me. And all things, it is Christ who strengthens me. And I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's the key. That's the key to this. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Look at it. doesn't matter how much money you've got in your pocket. Doesn't matter how many clothes you've got in your closet. Doesn't matter how much money you've got in your bank account. The fact of the matter is this you can do all things, no matter if you're rich or you're poor, through Christ who strengthens you. Nevertheless, he says, you have done well. That you shared in my distress. What distress? Well, this is one of Paul's, what's known as one of Paul's prison epistles. He's writing this as he's in prison. It was more like house arrest. He wasn't in like a clink or a jail like we would consider it to be. He was writing this from house arrest. But the problem is, is that while he was on house arrest, they would kind of let him go during the day. Kind of let him, let him do his thing, walk around the house, and just kind of because they knew that Paul was a man of good character. But at the end of the day, they would chain him up to a Roman soldier at the end of the day. And he goes into talking about that. He would say, those from Caesar's household, they salute you too. We're going to get into that. Now, You Philippians know, in verse 15, you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. They were the only church that sent him anything to help in his time of need. For even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessities, while he was going through some issues in Thessalonica. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. You see what he says? He says, listen, I wasn't really worried about what you were giving me. I wasn't really too concerned about what you were giving me. He says, I was just happy that you were thinking of me. Because that's more of a blessing. Because the godly character was coming through. He says, I didn't really seek the gift, but I was really happy about the blessing that was going to come to you as a result of your gift to me. What I was really doing is rejoicing in the fact that you are showing godly character. And that godly character will always want to give true godly character will want to give whatever it is you got for the service of christ whether time talent or treasure if you don't got time and you got talent or treasure give one of those if you don't got talent or treasure and you got time then give that give what you got because that's the heart of christ not everybody's got money okay some people do and by the way some people say some in the bible some people have money i say praise lord because the church really goes on with people who got a couple of bucks But not everybody does. And there are some really godly men and godly women who got loads of money and used that money to bless the church and further the work of God. They can't stand up and preach. And they don't really have that much time to give. But you know, they give what they got. And so he says this. He says, I was really excited that you guys were giving what you had because they were giving out of what they didn't have. Do you understand? This was not a rich church. This was not the church at Corinth. This is not a church with money and means and power and influence. This was a little tiny church. You know what shocks me the most? And came, we moved to Sanford from Wells to, to, to start to grow you know, this particular fellowship. And it's been growing. And as the Lord has been moving, the Lord's been growing. We've been kind of praying about different directions and where to go and what we're going to do as we start to outgrow this space. 
But you know what they said to me? I talked to a couple of different pastors. You know what they said to me in this, in this area? They said, don't go to Sanford. There's no money there. That's what they said. Wow. I'm going to tell you. I'm legit. Legit pastors. They said, don't go to Sanford. There's no money there. Wow. I said, that's too bad. But I'm going there. That's all there is to it. Because there are, there are many, many people, even within ministry, and they're only concerned about the dollar. They're only concerned about how much money they're going to get. Listen, I'm going to tell you right now, we got this space, the bills are getting paid, everything's good, people are getting saved, we got people signed up to be baptized, and we're doing some things, some amazing things. We're going to be starting a youth group pretty soon. You know, I mean, the, the Lord is really moving. And don't make no mistake about it. There are going to be people who are going to come, and try into the, come into this flock and try to divide this flock. Beware of that. They will. As we start to grow, I really believe that the church blesses those who give out of what they don't have. He goes on, and he says this, Indeed, I have all. In verse 18, Indeed, I have all and abound. I am full, having received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. And the sacrifice, what he's talking about there is it's not talking about the sacrifice of what was given. It's the heart behind what they were given. He's not saying that, he's not saying that there was any you know, sweet-smelling aroma in whatever it was that was given to Paul. It was the heart behind what was given to Paul. And my God shall supply all your need according to His riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Now to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. You see that? The contentment that he's looking for, the contentment that he's trying to impart on to those believers at Philippi. He's saying, listen, and he's really giving them a word of exhortation. He's saying, listen, you guys don't be divided on this. Don't be separated. Don't stay unified in Christ. And then so much to say, don't fight over useless stuff. Try to stay unified. Try to, try to stay together as a body. But in all those things, remember that with your anxiety, if you really want to know what's causing you all the worry and causing you all the fear and causing you all the distress, it's a lack of prayer. It's a lack of prayer. Look, I go through it too. Prayer is the remedy for this. I'm going to tell you right now. There is no other chemical implement that I've ever used that has given me the peace that prayer brings. Prayer is the thing that causes our hearts and our minds to settle. Listen, there are even times in and throughout life, man, I, I can tell you, I, I know for a fact, my wife will know when I need to go pray. She'll call me right out on it. You need to go pray. You're being a little miserable. A little miserable. I can see it. You need to go pray. It's just what happens. All of a sudden, man, things are just, you know, you get 10 million things just kind of mounting and mounting and mounting, and all of a sudden, man, you just want to explode. And the very last thing you want to do is go pray because it takes patience to do it. It takes time to do it. And it takes an incredible amount of faith to do it. It takes a lot of faith to get alone with God and to speak to the Lord and to remember that what you say He hears. You have to remember that He hears you. He bends, the Old Testament says that he bends his ear. He inclines his ear to listen to the cry of his children. He listens to you. And he's never, ever too busy for you. And listen, we, get into, we fall into this rut of thinking that maybe we've, done, we've made too many mistakes today to go pray. You know, maybe I've, I've done or said too many wrong things today to go pray. Or maybe, you know, the Lord's angry with me because, you know, there's some, there's some sin going on in my heart or I haven't really gone to him and repented about this or that. And we start to think that God doesn't want to hear from you or that he's upset with you. Or we start to think that the Lord is angry with us. And so we don't want to go pray. And we don't want to go, really go talk to the Lord and allow him to settle our hearts. Listen, I say this all the time and I don't mean it to be flippant, but God's not dumb. Do you really think that God doesn't want to hear from you because you think that like somehow there's some sort of secret sin that he doesn't know about? Come on. He knows what's going on in our hearts and in our minds. He wants to hear from you. Listen, he's not standing up on the... He's not like the, the man gods that we think about. He's not in heaven just waiting like, you know, with a bolt of lightning in his hand, just waiting for you to make one stupid mistake and crack you with a lightning bolt. That's not what I, he's, he's exceeding in mercy. 
full of love. And we're his children. You think he doesn't want to hear from you? I love talking to my kids. I do. I love talking to them. I love talking to my wife. You think he doesn't want to hear from you? He wants to hear from you. So, and then we fall into the other rut. We fall into the rut of thinking like, oh, well, he already knows what I need. And the Bible says that. He already knows what you, what you need before you even ask him. But that's not the point. The relationship doesn't get cultivated without communication. It just doesn't. But you know what was great about Paul, even in this? He says, greet every saint. He says, this is just another remedy. Greet every saint. And who's the saints? That's us. He says, greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren who are with me greet you. Now, he's in prison. Now, listen. Who are the brethren? All the saints greet you, but especially those who are of Caesar's household. You know what that means? That means those guards that he was chained up to, every single one of them that was chained up to him each and every night. These were Praetorian guards. These were no joke. He's sitting there as they would chain shifts. He was preaching to them as he was chained up. He's preaching to them and introducing them to Christ while he's imprisoned. Look at Your life is a ministry. You know that? Your life is a ministry. No matter how difficult things get, no matter how hard life can get, no matter how full of worry and anxiety and fear, listen, don't think that God can't use you. He can use you. He will use you right where you're at. Because he always wants you to reproduce. Love reproduces. You know, he would tell in the Old Testament, we just got done going through Genesis. He would say, go and fill the earth. Reproduce. Fill the earth. I want you to be fruitful and multiply. And how we can apply that spiritually to the days we live in now is that he always wants you to be fruitful and multiply, spiritually speaking, too. He always wants you to take what you have and give it to somebody else. He always wants you to reproduce spiritually and give life to somebody else who doesn't have it because love produces life. The love of Christ that's in you produces life. And Paul took advantage of that, even in chains. Writing so much so. And he was so content, even in chains, that he wrote back to the church at Philippi and said, don't worry about me. Thank you for the gifts that you sent me. I'm really happy that at least the love of Christ is shining through you enough that you, that you were thinking about me in prison. You were worried about me and where I was and how I was doing. And he says, that is going to be accounted to you and to your account. Not the gift. He goes, not that I was really looking for the gift or really needed it, but I'm thankful that you gave it because the heart shows me something about your life. But then he says, but there are people here that are hearing about Christ that are getting saved. And now they're your brothers and your sisters. And within the church, this brings me back to my first point, the major theme throughout the, the book of Philippians is unity in Christ. Unity. That's important. Holding fast to the unity of Christ and not letting us separate. Listen, real quick, and I'm, I'll show you what I mean. Turn to, turn to Philippians chapter 2. I'll show you what I mean. <clears throat> and I, I read this one. This, this Philippians chapter 2, I, could pro I probably have it memorized, but I'll read it just in case I don't. You read this all the time. Therefore, if there's any consolation in Christ, if there's any comfort and love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being, look at this, like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. You see that? And he gives us the greatest example of all to follow. Look at this. Let each of you not only look out for his own interest, but also the interest of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being the form of God, didn't consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And I said this on Sunday, and I'll say it here now. Are you okay with being a welcome mat for Christ? Are you? Do you really understand that we're not really owed anything anyway? I said it on Sunday as we're going through Ephesians. You remember me saying it. I made a big point of it. Are you okay with being a welcome mat for Jesus? Are you okay with looking at Christ and saying, you know something? I'm content. I'm not owed anything. I'm not owed the house, the car, the bank account, the husband, the wife. I'm not owed the kids. I'm not owed anything. All these things are just grace upon grace upon grace and gift upon gift upon gift. And in all things, 
I'm not owed anything. If there was anybody who's owed everything, it was Christ, but yet he made himself of no reputation. You know who Christ was in, in human term? I'm just going to tell you something. I'm, as you study the Bible and as you really look into the Word of God, you know that the Lord Jesus as a kid was the weird kid. You know that. Perfect. Sinless kid. And you know that he probably got made fun of and poked at. He was probably a goody two-shoes, and all the other kids wanted probably nothing to do with him because he never sinned, never did anything wrong. Probably super friendly. But he was probably the weird kid in the groups. Nobody wanted to make, nobody wanted to hang out with him because he wasn't going to do anything wrong. He wasn't going to go getting into all the mischief that most kids want to get into. And so he was probably the kid that was looked down upon. Probably the kid that was kicked around a little bit, maybe bullied here and there. He was the one that was hanging out with adults. Talking about the Word of God when no other kids are really into doing that. Sitting down with them in the temple. Discussing the Word of God. And then when challenged by his own mother, he'd say, well, you know, didn't you know that I would be about my father's business? Amen. Taking the form of a bondservant. But then he didn't consider it robbery to be equal with God. And being found in person, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient, obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross, which was, by the way, the most humiliating way to die. Can you imagine? Listen, these are the things about Christ that should blow our minds. These are the things that should really, every time we think that we're owed some sort of happiness, Right? Every time, and I talked about this on Sunday, every time we think that we're owed some sort of, you know, like I hear it all the time and it makes me nuts. I understand it and, it, you know, I, I grasp the point, but nobody deserves happiness. That's just, it's just not the truth. I'm sorry, it's just not. It's just, it's just that nobody deserves, everybody who thinks that they deserve to be happy, it's just not biblical. Because if anybody got, who got something he didn't deserve, it was Christ for sure. He was, he was without sin in this world. And for anybody to sit there and say, well, I don't deserve this. Listen, look, do you really want to talk about what we deserve? Do you want to talk about that? I mean, honestly, listen, I'm not saying this to be like a downer here, but do you really want to talk about what we deserve? We've sinned against a holy God. We have. We stand in Him now righteous, cleansed purchased with the blood of Christ, sealed by the Holy Spirit. We are righteous in Him and in Him alone. And by the way, we didn't do anything to deserve it. The Bible's clear on that. We didn't do anything to deserve that. But that should cause us to glorify Christ more. That should cause us to praise God even more. And listen, it's not, it, this is not a very kind of uplifting, self-affirming message. The, the Word of God is just not. It's not something that you're, it's not, this is not like a, a self-help book. It's not. It's very, he's very little, con, very, concerned very little with our self-esteem. And I, I mean that in the, in the truest sense of the word. So please forgive me if it sounds wrong, but he's very, He's not really concerned with our self-esteem and how we view ourselves and whether or not we love ourselves. Because everybody's concerned about in our culture today, you know, wanting us to love ourselves. And they think that the problem with most people is that most people don't love themselves. The truth of the matter is, is that, that that's just not true. Everybody loves themselves. That's a major problem, by the way. Facebook proves it. <laughs> Have you seen some people's Facebook pages and how many selfies they take? They got whole selfie sticks now to help you do it. Everybody loves themselves. But when you start to become consumed by yourself, that's when you get the most miserable. <clears throat> In Christ, <coughs> there's no more joy than when you find contentment in Christ. There's no more joy than when you can really truly find stability and contentment and joy and peace in knowing Jesus Christ. Remembering that he humbled himself to the point of death, even, even the death of a cross, the most humiliating way to die. And he did it, and he didn't deserve that. And it reminds me that I'm not really owed anything. I'm not. 
And this goes against the grain of my flesh. It does. This goes against what most self-help authors will write. This goes against what even most Christian, some, some Christian psychologists and secular psychologists will say. But I trust the Word of God. I trust what it says. And I'm going to finish with this real quick. In verse 9, the result of that, the result of Christ emptying himself and lowering himself and being a bondservant and submitting himself to the authorities of men. By the way, the result of him submitting himself to his own creation, by his spoken word, he's the one that held the fists together that punched him in the face, that held the hands together that ripped out his beard, that by his own spoken word in Colossians, by his own spoken word, he held together the nails that went through his hands, by his own spoken word. This is, what, this is the result of that. In verse 9, it says, Therefore God also has highly exalted him, and given him the name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. Of those in heaven, of those on earth, and of those under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Because that's what our mouths were meant to do. To glorify the name of Christ. And it's a hard message for even me to hear sometimes. It is. But the truth of the matter is is that when I become more Christ-centered and less self-centered, I don't know. And and I fear for the church at large because this is a message that is kind of sweeping across the church to really get Christ-centeredness away from you and start to worry about your own self-centeredness where every message is a motivational speech and how you should be living, which is how we should be living is the Bible. And we, we get that, you know. But we need to keep our eyes on Christ. We need to really focus on Jesus. And really keep our eyes on his word and what he says and get our minds right. And listen, what you'll find is that you start to apply the Bible through prayer, supplication, and the worries and the concerns that you have, your mind starts to change. You start to really take a look at the person of Christ and your mind and the way you think and the way we act. And how we feel starts to change. Amen?